on the third new moon after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt. On that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me the kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits for the people all round, saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot. With a beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in a fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord to look, and many of them perish. Also, let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us, saying, Set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, Go down and come up bringing Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Good morning, church. Why don't we pray as we come to these tremendous words. Father, you have said that this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. So, Father, may that be us. 
this morning. Help us listen to you and hear you speak. In Jesus' name, amen. So how has your day been? Now, I ask that not as a mere greeting, as if to say, how's it going? I ask that because today is no ordinary day. Today is a day when God's people gather in worship. This is a day when God meets with us. It's a special day. So, how has your day been? I think for most of us, that includes myself, it's in many respects a fairly ordinary day. The alarm goes off, maybe you hit snooze a couple of times, especially in this weather. You get dressed, you get that morning coffee, fetch some breakfast, get the kids sorted. Maybe there's a quiet time in there somewhere. It's a fairly regular morning routine. And from here, you might have some plans for the day. Maybe you'll spend time with family or you have something else exciting to get off to. For my wife and I, a a normal Sunday looks like church at at 11 a.m. Sorry, guys. Fried chicken for lunch. Hopefully, you see our parents, go for a nice walk, and a chill evening at home. For most of us, most of the time, it's fairly routine. One Sunday looks similar to another, and around and around they go. Now, none of that's bad. Routine's not bad. But amidst the routine, it's easy to forget. It's easy to forget that this today is a special time. I don't think the Israelites had that problem when they met God at Mount Sinai. I think on that occasion, they had a pretty clear idea of what a momentous experience it was. Israel had been waiting for this day for a long time. Maybe you remember back in Exodus chapter 3, God told Moses that this day was coming. This is what God said. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. And then we saw Moses clash with Pharaoh. We saw Pharaoh refuse to give in. We saw God tear Egypt apart with terrifying plagues. The firstborn was slaughtered. The Israelites were led through the middle of the sea. And now finally, finally they have come here. Mount Sinai. It's all been leading up to this, like the climax of a movie. The time has now come. Here it is. This is the mountain. And so now Moses says, in just three days from now, we will see our God. We see in verse 11, be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You can imagine, can't you? The anticipation, the excitement, the fear. So today we'll look at three things. Firstly, who are these people that get to meet with God? Secondly, who is the God they're meeting? And finally, how is it that these people can approach God? So the people that God invites to approach him are special. They have a dear place in his heart and they have a unique and privileged responsibility. So Moses goes up the mountain and God tells him these important 
words. If you want to read verses 5 and 6. If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Could there be any greater honor for a group of people to be those chosen by the God of the universe? These are the ones that God calls to come and worship him. And there's three ways that God here describes Israel. Each of them is a marvelous privilege. They are his treasured possession. Of everything that belongs to God, his chosen people are his greatest treasure. And God owns a lot, doesn't he? He owns the whole universe. The oceans are his, the land and the mountains, all the galaxies in the vast stretches of space. God owns it all, but his people, Israel, are his chief delight. My grandfather's treasured possession was his mother's engagement ring. It's over a hundred years old by now, gold and encrusted with rubies. And my grandfather was the youngest of 11 kids. So he was the baby of the family. And his mother was very, very dear to him. So when that ring was passed on to him, he prized that ring. And he was, he was a wealthy man. He was a successful businessman. He owned a fair bit. But of everything he owned, that ring was his favorite. It was dear to his heart, just as Israel is to God. They are also a royal priesthood. To be a priest means that you get special access to God. You get to step into his holy presence, and there you get to bring the needs of others before God's throne. This is a high calling. This is a sacred purpose. And everyone in Israel was meant to initially be a priest. Every Israelite was meant to have this intimate access to God. Unfortunately, that's a privilege they later forfeited. holy nation. They are a country like no other. A nation consecrated to God and his purposes, set apart so that they particularly belong to God. And because of this holy calling, they are a nation with a responsibility to live holy lives. This is who these people are at the foot of Mount Sinai. This is the people who are about to meet with God. And this is also us. I want you to hear these words from Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, and see if they don't sound familiar. He's writing to Christians and he says that you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. This is us. Through Jesus, this is us. Jesus died as our Passover lamb to save us from God's wrath. He led us out of slavery to sin and he's leading us to the land of promise. He redeemed us from our old master so that we might belong to God. 
And so we are now God's holy chosen people and we are given the monumental privilege of drawing near to God and representing him in the world. This is, this is who we are. This is our identity. And it's an identity that the world doesn't recognise. To the world, we're all sorts of different things. Some of it's not so flattering. Perhaps for some, we're deluded freaks or a corrupt institution, maybe. On the other hand, some of the press is a bit nicer. Some non-Christians might think of the church as a force for social good or perhaps as having played an important part of in Australia's history. Basically, kind people. It's what the world thinks. But none of that fundamentally defines us. Even the good stuff. That is not at the core who we are. And we need, to, we need to understand that. We need to know who we are. In a day when the, church, the, the world's opinion of us seems to be in flux. The church of Jesus Christ is dearly loved by God. We have privileged access to him through his son. We are his instrument to accomplish his purposes in the world. We are. The church is special. It, it really is. We, we need to get that. Jesus' church alone carries the message of salvation to a world that desperately needs it. We only as his treasured possession, are going to endure into the next age. The church alone represents God in his world. We need to stand firm in our identity. We can't let the world define it for us. And also... With a holy identity comes a holy call. A call to holy living. God has made us his holy people and that means we need to act like it. If we are to represent God in this world, then our lives need to be consistent with God's purposes. If we say that we meet with God, that even right now, as we meet... We are meeting not just with one another, but we are meeting with God. If we say that, then we need to have lives that are directed by God's will. Nothing less will do. Do you remember at the start of the year where we went through the Sermon on the Mount? This is Jesus calling us to a better way of life. A life marked by God's standard of righteousness. A life that steers clear of hypocrisy. A life where we obey God from the heart, not just in appearances. Remember hearing that. That's what we need to pursue. Each of us personally and all of us together. And when, as sincere believers, we fail to do that, as we do, we need to remember who we are. We are still God's holy people. Our sins don't change that. This is a status bestowed on us by God. So we seek to live God's way, and when we fail... We seek forgiveness and we push on because that's who we are. That is what God has called us to. We are his holy, priestly possession. And the God 
that we meet with. He is holy. And he is to be feared. He is transcendent. Almighty. And he must never be approached lightly. We see that Moses sets up a boundary around the mountain. A no-go zone. This is the place where God's holy presence is going to show up. So you need to keep your distance, he says to the Israelites. Don't even touch the mountain. Under pain of death, do not touch that mountain. You know the signs that say trespassers will be prosecuted? Moses has set up signs that say trespassers will die, stoned, or shot with an arrow. Well, that's heavy. And for good reason, it's this heavy. God is the Lord of the universe, and he's holy. That means he's otherly, transcendent, set apart from anything else, especially anything sinful, like human beings. God is pure. Sinners are impure. We must be kept apart. There must be distance. And you can see God's holiness and his majesty On the third day, that third day that Moses had been talking about, when God shows up. This is a terrifying scene. The Lord descends on Mount Sinai in fire. And no one would have missed this dramatic entrance. It would have been a sensory overload. Picture it. You see this Thick, dark smoke coming up from the mountain. A smoke that comes from the fire of God's presence. Remember the bushfires last year? And maybe you remember some of the satellite photos on the news that showed the smoke coming up from the eastern half of Australia and blowing over to South America. Well, Israel Israel can see that smoke coming up from the mountain. And they can also see lightning pierce the sky all around. The mountain is surrounded by these bright flashes of supercharged electricity. Do you know that when lightning hits a tree, it carries so much energy that all the water inside the tree is just vaporized and that actually makes it explode it's powerful stuff and you can see that going on all around you and they can also feel it the the mountain trembles it's as if it was hit by an enormous earthquake and it seems as if the very earth is going to give way under the weight of God's majesty and you can hear you can hear the noise that envelops this scene there's thunder cracking again and again and it's so loud that it hurts your ears and there are these trumpet blasts, and they the roar through the camp. You are surrounded by this relentless, deafening clamor. And then God speaks to Moses in a thunderous voice. And stick around next week, what he is going to shout from the top of Mount Sinai to all Israel. 
How would you react if this was you? My grandmother, when there was a thunderstorm going on, would hide under a table. She was terrified of lightning. But I tell you, amidst a scene this intense, this volatile, this supernatural, we'd all want a table to hide under. Just like the Israelites. They trembled before God. This is a holy God. And he is to be feared. He is supremely majestic and glorious. We can never lose sight of that. Do you fear God? This is the God who has brought down nations, the God more powerful than the billions of stars that he created, the God who accomplishes his will with the force of a mere command. We should be amazed at him. We should bow before him in reverence. We should feel incredibly small before him. We should fear him. But if you are a Christian, you should not be terrified of him. Because Jesus died for you. He buried your sins in the ground. He eliminated any reason for God to unleash his fury upon you. And he's made you holy. He's given you the right to be God's child. And so we fear God, but not in the same way the Israelites did. The Israelites were afraid for their safety. They were afraid that they would die before God's dangerous holiness. But Christians, we we fear God from a place of safety. When I, I was a kid, my parents had this open fireplace, and I loved it. It was awesome to see the fire rage and consume the fuel and to feel the heat that was radiating out of the fireplace and to watch this red burning flame. It was awesome. But as a kid, fire can be dangerous. And so my parents put this grate around the fire to fence it off so that their child could watch that fire from a place of safety, so that I could experience the fire without being in danger of being burnt by it. And as Christians, we contemplate God's power and grandeur. We get to experience His holiness, but from a place of safety. We are near to him and protected by Jesus. We stand in awe of him at the same time knowing that he deeply, deeply loves us. We tremble at his power, but with confidence that we belong to him. We fear God knowing that he won't destroy us. God is holy and to be feared. And the incredible thing is we get to draw near to him. The majestic, awe-inspiring God invites us to approach him. And he even comes down to meet us. Have a look at verse 4. When God brought Israel out of Egypt, he brought them to himself. He didn't just give them freedom for the sake of freedom. He gave them freedom for a purpose. 
He gave them freedom so that they could come close to him. Verse 11 then tells us that God came down in the sight of all the people. It's amazing. God showed himself in such a way that he could be seen by the average Israelite. And verse 17 says that they got to meet God. They had the privilege of encountering him. What an astounding honor that Israel had. And so Moses tells them to prepare for that encounter. So they need to consecrate themselves, which would have involved animal sacrifices. And there's a ritual washing they have to do, and they're to be abstinent for three days so that they can be without distractions as they anticipate their encounter with God. They get to come near to God. But, as, as we've seen, they had to keep their distance. God warns Moses that if the people break through to him, he will break out against them. If they come too close to God, he will destroy them. No wonder the Israelites are frightened, senseless. So, it's kind of strange. On the one hand, they get to come near to God, but with great care and with limits. How about us? Do we approach God in the same way that the Israelites did at Mount Sinai? Is there a line that tells us how close we're allowed to come to God? Well, as it is, the Lord Jesus has changed everything. He's changed everything. I want us to read a bit of of, of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, from verse 18, if you're reading along. Have a listen to what this says. For you have not come to what may be touched a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet whose voice and a voice who made whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them for they could not endure the order that was given if even a beast touches the mountain it shall be stoned indeed so terrifying was the fight that was the sight that Moses said i tremble with fear well, that's, that's what we're looking at in Exodus. That's our scene in, chapter, in Exodus 19. That's Mount Sinai. And what we're told is that we have not come to Mount Sinai to meet with God. We don't come to God with this sense of terror. We meet God at a different place. Where is that? You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Mount Sinai is not our experience of God. The terror that the Israelites felt, we don't need to experience because we meet God in a different place. I'm not talking about a church building. We spiritually meet with God in heaven. When we worship God, we step into his very presence The same mode of God's presence that was manifested at Sinai, the same level of God's presence that dwelt in the holy of holies in the tabernacle. God is in us. We are the temple of the Holy 
Spirit. So when the church worships, we are surrounded, we are indwelt by His glory. That is us each and every Sunday. That is your family in your devotional times. That is you in your personal times of prayer and in the word before the Lord. That is us right now as we gather in worship. It's true that a Christian's whole life is meant to be one of worship, and I'm not trying to downplay that, but these times of, let's say, direct communion we have with God, they are times when we uniquely encounter Him. When we come into God's presence in a conscious and deliberate way. And we come to God not guarding our every step. We don't come with terror, but with confidence, with boldness. And we come to a place of joy and celebration. I love that phrase in Hebrews, the innumerable angels in festal gathering. They're celebrating. And that, that part that also says, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Christians that have gone before us, perfected through Jesus. We gather with them. This is a place of acceptance, of family intimacy. This is where we come to meet with God. And for all this, for all these priceless treasures and privileges, we give thanks to the Lord Jesus. His blood has washed us from our sins. He has consecrated us. He has made us holy, acceptable to God, fit to step into his presence so that we can worship God with awe, with reverence, with wonder, and with that joy in the Holy Spirit that we were talking about. Let's recognize what a wonderful privilege we have. Times that you and your family spend in prayer and in the Word, they are not ordinary times. They are times of sitting in the Lord's very presence as we worship Him. Times when the church gathers, they are... They are special times. They are times when God meets with us as we worship him. This, now, is no ordinary moment. Brothers and sisters, God is here with us. The more we appreciate this, the more it will change the way we see these times of worship. We'll see them as not just something else on the calendar, not just something to be ticked off or gotten through, but something to anticipate, something to look forward to. Maybe we need a mindset change. Maybe when we grasp what a wonderful privilege worship is, all of a sudden we'll see prayer as not something we decide to do or not. The prayer meeting tomorrow night is something maybe we will or maybe we won't go to. But it's a privilege to be grasped. Sunday services, maybe they seem like a burden. We grasp what a privilege they are. We, we look forward to them. And when we do come, we don't come casually. We have a sense of the occasion. And we come to God with reverence. And also, it should make us conscientious of the sin in our lives. We've been sanctified through Jesus, that's true. But that doesn't mean we don't need to deal with with 
some of our sin. We can't come to God with sin that's just lingering there. We haven't thought to confess it, tried to eliminate it, made any efforts to repent of it. We need to bring those before the Lord so that when we come, we step into his presence. We come to him with sincerity. This is an amazing privilege and an honor. We are God's treasured possession. We are his holy people, and we get to come into his holy presence. So may we always come with reverence and awe and joy. Let's pray. Father, thank you. You are good and holy and true. And so we thank you that you invite us to draw near to you. You make us your special treasured possession. This is a privilege, and we we are sorry that we have not grasped that privilege like we should. Please help us to do that. Please help us to fear you, but fear you knowing that we are safe in our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.